doing a case interview with Mr. Jack Reed, former president of Local 287, recorded at the Labor Center, South Lona Street, Muncie, Indiana, April 4, 1969. Mr. Reed, as you probably uh, have heard, uh, I'm doing research to uh, write a history of Local 287 as part of my doctoral program for uh, doctorate in history at the University of Miami. The uh, taped interviews will be, be placed on uh, reserve in the library, and uh, anything that we record here will be uh, preserved for posterity. And uh, the comments that uh, you make today will add to the history of Local 287 and the aspects to the history of the community and uh, to uh, the country as a whole, to some degree. Now, uh, Jack, it's a special privilege for me to talk with you because I've known you for such a very long time, and I know you to be one of the truly outstanding uh, labor leaders of the community who has made a tremendous contribution to labor uh, in the Muncie area. Uh, you're one of the uh, first people that I can remember uh, as a boy and a young man as uh, being a leader in organizing uh, the unions in this community. Jack, I don't remember how far back you go in the labor movement, but suppose we begin by uh, by you telling me uh, when and how you became involved in the labor movement uh, in the Muncie community. I became involved when the Local 47, <coughs> not Local 47, but the AFL came in, and a gentleman by the name of Mr. Davis who organized the union in our shop, the one of you. But that was a failure. Then, the CIO was organized in Milwaukee, and their organization <coughs> came down to Muncie, and that's when I became interested and became active in helping to organize the OAW, CIO. Very fine, Jack. Jack, could you tell me, do you remember when you went to work at Warner Gear? I went to work at Warner Gear on January the 3rd, 1931. Well, that certainly has been a long time, and that means, of course, you were there when the uh, union was first organized and well before. Uh, approximately how many people worked at Warner Gear uh, when you uh, became employed for that company? When I, was, when I started working in Warner Gear, there was 1,100 people. Mm -hmm. In fact, was there any labor union at all at Warner Gear in 1931, 32? None whatever. None whatever. Not even a company union of any kind, what we might call it? Well, they had uh, later, later after I went to work at Warner Gear, they had what was known as a company union, uh, but I never belonged to it. I see. Well, in the uh, Muncie community in the early 1930s, uh, Jack, uh, uh, what was the general status of organized labor? Were there unions in the community uh, in the early 1930s? Uh, were they generally accepted uh, by the uh, power structure, as we would use modern terms, the, uh, the local... Uh, uh, political uh, leaders and uh, the social and economic leaders of the community? There was nothing uh, <coughs> for industrial workers. The only unions that were active in Muncie and Delaware County at that time were the craft unions in the AFL. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, when you uh, began trying to organize unions after uh, the uh, NRA was passed, uh, giving the right uh, workers to organize their own unions, even in the industrial uh, plant. Uh, what was the, if you remember, Jack, what uh, were some of the attitudes uh, in the public uh, in general in the community? Uh, the newspapers, for example, uh, the churches, the civic leaders, the business leaders, the uh, political figures. In general, uh, was there uh, uh, sympathy for organized labor's objectives, or was there uh, opposition to organized labor, or maybe both? It was very negative. I see. And general attitude was negative. Uh, in other words, uh, Mr. Browder, we had to, uh, any meetings we had, we had to have them in secrecy. We couldn't rent a room uh, in the city of Muncie until Dr. Bunch was elected mayor. And after he was elected mayor, we had the opportunity then to have our meetings in the old city barns after he, after he was <coughs> defeated. I'll say it that way, that uh, then we had to revert back to the secrecy ways of having a meeting until. Jack, when was uh, Mr. Bunch uh, mayor? Do you remember? It was in 1937. Mm-hmm. 36 and 37. 36 and 37. 
Who was mayor just before that? Do you remember? I don't remember. I don't either, but I can easily look that up uh, down at uh, the mayor's office. I wonder, uh, Mr. Reed, if you would uh, recount for me briefly your memory uh, of uh, the organizing of Local 287 at Warner Gear. How and when did the workers at Warner Gear become organized uh, in the UAW, and uh, did you uh, play a role in that organization? I very played a very insignificant role in the early organization of Local 287. Uh, <clears throat> however, I attended the meeting, uh, one of the meetings rather, when they were attempting to organize, and then I, of course, joined the union and voted in the election for representation. Uh, not until 1939 did I become uh, really active in the uh, affairs of the local. I see. Do you remember who were some of the early leaders of uh, Local 287 in the organization stages, uh, Mr. Reed? Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Wilbur V. Coons was, was the first president. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Ray Babbitt, who is deceased now. Uh, Mr. Leo Myers, Virgil Hayes, Carl Parker, Ben Weeks. Oh, this great number. Very fine. Now, these names, many of them are familiar to me, but uh, I wonder, having been away from the community for several years, uh, are these people, uh, many of them living now, or uh, most of them have uh, retired and uh, left the community, or uh, maybe even uh, some of them are deceased, I know you mentioned. The only one that I know that is living today that I have mentioned is Brother Weeks and Brother Wilbur V. Coons. The rest of them are all deceased. Uh, Mr. Cruz is living in this community now? He's living in Florida. He's, uh, what part do you know? In the northern part. I'll try to make it a point to, uh, get around to seeing him within the next, uh, two or three months. Well, this is very helpful. Now, another question related to this, uh, you may, uh, have read, uh, Jack, uh, if I may call you Jack, we've been friends so long, and I wish you'd call me Dan, because, uh, you were one of the people that helped me most when I was, uh, active in a labor union movement. Uh, Jack, uh, you probably remember that uh, Robert and Helen Lynn, two prominent sociologists, were here in Muncie in the early 1930s, and they did a study called Middletown, which came out in the late 20s, and another about 37 called uh, Middletown in Transition. You probably uh, have heard of the books, maybe you've read some of them, because they are on the community. Now, in this book, uh, if I remember correctly, that came out in 1936 to 37, uh, the Lynns uh, are really quite pessimistic about future prospects for labor in the community, and one of their reasons um, is that uh, they feel that there really isn't much of a strong indigenous labor movement, and uh, their conclusion is that if labor is organized in Muncie, it probably will have to come from an outside stimulus because uh, there just isn't that much of a, an active interest on the part of the industrial workers in the community. Now, my question to you is, do uh, you agree with this, or do you feel that uh, Local 287 was largely organized from uh, local effort. Well, there's no question about it, Dan. Uh, local 287 was organized by the people, the local people in the community and the plant. Uh, practically all the UAW locals were organized by the by leaders of, of, in this community that worked in the plant, probably. Well, that, that's go ahead. I'm sorry. Nobody, nobody from the outside, with the exception of designated representatives from the international came in and done any work that was mostly done by the boys themselves. I'm very glad to hear that, and that uh, substantiates uh, Mayor Cooey's uh, point of view. He reflects the same attitude, and uh, this, this is interesting because uh, in 1936, uh, here we had two prominent sociologists concluding that there really wasn't that much of a local uh, desire to uh, take the risks necessary to establish a union, strong union movement within the community. And uh, evidently, this did happen within a year after he uh, published this book. Well, then may I say it is that when General Motors, after the sit-down strike, uh, General Motors, of course, was the leader in the, in the start of the CIO proper itself, the OAW-CIO. Right. And uh, immediately after the organization of, uh, <coughs> of the uh, AAA locals and Mel Corini locals in Muncie, one of the years, was busy uh, preparing for their their um, campaign at the same time. 
so we were all all three locals were in the uh, followed the, the lead of the boys in, in Michigan and Chippewa. I see. Which of the three locals in Muskie uh, took the initiative, if we may use that term, or uh, were all three active approximately at the same time? All three about the same time, then. I see. Uh, let me ask you a little further question. Uh, after these three locals had become organized, uh, was there an attempt on the part of the leadership of these three locals to assist other, uh, what we might call embryonic labor movements and other industrial plants uh, within the community? That's right. Uh, <clears throat> after we were organized, it was formed in, in Delaware County, uh, the Industrial Union Council. And in this council, they had a, a, a committee set up uh, noted as the organizing and uh, labor organizing and negotiating committee of the council, of which I happen to be the first chairman. That's when I first heard of you, Jack. And there, from there, we organized about everything that was loose in Delaware County. Right, right. Jack, uh, when and why did you personally become interested in the labor movement? Well, this may seem strange to some people that will probably be listening to what I have to say, but I <clears throat> enjoyed my employment in Warner Gear, but the conditions under which I was working in Warner Gear were sub, way below subnormal. In other words, uh, we had no, uh, uh, nothing to say about our wages, and nothing to say about uh, conditions of employment, and nothing to say about uh, uh, whether we worked for 10 cents an hour or 50 cents an hour. Uh, so I thought it was time that <clears throat> the people who worked in the plant and furnished their hands and their brains to help produce the product that the, the plant was selling, but the employee himself should have some right to save uh, what kind of uh, benefits and wages they were going to get from their efforts. And that's when I became interested and started to fight for what I thought was right for the individual. Well, that's a very uh, interesting uh, point of view, uh, Mr. Reed, and I'm quite sure it's going to help a lot of people understand uh, why people like yourself did become active in uh, organized labor uh, back during the 1930s. Uh, what official positions have you held within the local? I know that you've been president, and I'm quite sure you've had other uh, positions also. Well, Dan, I'm not bragging, but I'm very fortunate that the members of Local 287 have uh, honored me with about every position, uh, important position there is to hold in Local 287. I will say that in 1939, I was a steward in Plant 3, elected steward in Plant 3. One year later, I was elected chief steward in Plant 3. In 1941, I was elected president of Local 287. In 1942, uh, Brother Cooley was elected president. I was elected as vice president. Two other terms as vice president, I was elected. I was elected in 1944 as president of the union. In 1948 as president of the union. 1953 and 1954 as president of the union, four terms as steward, five terms as a negotiating committee. In other words, 17 of 21 years, I've been an officer, either steward, committeeman, president, or vice president of our local, of which I'm very proud. Jack, I would just imagine uh, right here that we could very easily say this probably represents a record in the labor organization. Uh, I, I doubt seriously if the uh, Anyone else could come close to matching that record of service and uh, high position to the local. Is that a fair statement? I think it's a fair statement. All I don't know if anybody else has been president over two terms. No, I don't either. Uh, offhand, I can't think of anyone. And certainly, I can't think of anyone who has had 17 out of 21 years uh, active service and uh, the top leadership positions of the organization. I wonder now if you could, uh, from uh, again from your memory, recount for me what uh, stick in your mind as uh, the major landmarks in the development of the local. Now again, you've been uh, active uh, since 1939. You have seen uh, many changes take place. You've seen many, almost all of the major achievements the local has made uh, during your time. And you tell me now uh, that you are president of the Retirees Council or whatever we may call the organization. Yes, that's right. Yes. All right, let, let me state it again, then, since I got you sort of uh, split off uh, from the original question there. Uh, 
if uh, if we were to ask you just to uh, to list what you consider to be half a dozen of the major achievements of the local from 1937 to 1969, what uh, do you remember as some of the outstanding uh, achievements of the organization? Well, I uh, I just don't know how what you mean, Dan, but if you mean uh, uh, the critical points. The achievements of those come, you know, year at a time, Dan. You know how those right. work. You get 50 cents an hour of this contract, and the next contract you maybe get a dime raise and a few advancements, which has been the goal and the object of the union from its inception. But there has been times in this period of, of our union when critical situations arose in which we had a very good opportunity of losing everything we had. So naturally, uh, I would consider the two critical, the two important and the two critical points in our local 287 was in 1941, at the beginning of World War II, and in 1944. Okay. Uh, in 1941, of course, was when the uh, materials that the one year company were using to build, uh, you know, the regular materials that they used for regular, uh, regular way of life and living, was stopped on the count of the war, which meant that Warner Gear would lose an employment from 3,800 to about 1,400 employees, uh, which is very critical. And Mr. J.C. Simpson, the president of Warner Gear, called uh, <coughs> the president, myself, and the executive board the negotiating committee in a very crucial meeting, at which time they asked us to go to Washington and see if we could do anything uh, with their band, according, accompanied by their representative, of course. And we could do anything to try to get some more work for our local, for our factory running, of which uh, myself and Brother Leo Myers and Brother Owen Stark were selected to represent the union. Mr. Prescott Johnson from Chicago was to represent the company, and Mr. Harrington from the UAW uh, regional office was to represent uh, the international union. Uh, we went to Washington, and we had quite a session there with different people, with, uh, our United States Senator and War Labor Board representatives, and nine months later, Warner Gear had an employment of 4,800 people all on war work. And you so feel that was quite an achievement. Yes, you, you feel that uh, the Union's cooperation, the Union's participation uh, in the trip to Washington uh, certainly uh, had something to do with uh, retaining the employment of these people and bringing additional uh, work into the uh, community. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Very and fine. In 1944, Dan, <clears throat> the company, this, if they want to cut out, they can. But the company became... Uh, Jack, we'd only cut out what you'd want to cut out. As far as we're concerned, whatever you remember is quite all right with that. Well, in 1944, we had a gentleman come in as Labor Relations Director of Warner Gear. We took the position that on the count of the war and the uh, patriotism that all employees should, should have, that wasn't necessary during that vital period of time before V-Day uh, to even recognize the Union. And we, we, came in, we got into a very serious condition uh, in which the company had let pile up some 72 grievances. So as, as we pleaded with the National Conciliation Service, with the War Labor Board, with everybody we knew to plead with and try to get some sort of sanity established with, the, with our negotiations with the company. At that time, we didn't have arbitration. And any time the company said no, that was the answer. The only, only chance we had was to, was to strike, was to have a stoppage, uh, which was of course, uh, not the proper way to do it, but, but that was our only hour. So we, there were 61 assemblers discharged at 3 o'clock on the first day of June before D-Day. On the sixth day of June, there was to be 450 transmissions delivered to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And on the first day of June, we all walked out of the plant. At the time, these 61 assemblers who were building these uh, parts were discharged. This is 1944. 1944. Uh -huh. On the gate of any one of the plants. 
We had a headquarters in South Hill Roberts, and we had about every high-ranking officer from uh, the government, telegrams from General Eisenhower and Pat Patterson and from the Secretary of War trying to force us back to work, which we were very sorry we were out because we knew the war was on. But it just got to the place where we couldn't, uh, couldn't operate. But we had no way to get those people back to work from arbitration or any other way. So then we had a, <clears throat> the officers came in and we had meetings with them at the Roberts. And in one week, I mean on the, on, Jan on June the 1st, I'm getting messed up here. On June the 1st. That's all right. We got plenty of time. On June the 1st, we had an agreement with Mr. Taylor, the War Labor Board Director in Washington. We had four subjects. We wanted to get rid of Mr. Gregory as a bargaining agent. We didn't want anybody penalized for um, uh, the action that we'd taken. We wanted the, the conciliation department to come in and arbitrate the 72 grievances. And that and the, and the arbitrator, or rather the, the Royal Labor Board then ordered the company to reinstate the 61 employees. We told them the minute they were reinstated, we'd all go back to work. Now, is that all the ones who have been fired? That's they... right. Mm -hmm. And then the War Labor Board, through Dr. Taylor, ordered all those 61 employees back to work, and we followed them in on Monday morning. And then I received a telegram from Dr. Taylor that Harry S. Schumann, one of the top uh, arbitrators of the U.S. government, would be in on the 6th day of June to start hearing the, you know, hearing the grievances. Right. Uh, of course, you remember he was here on D-Day. That the June wasn't that thing. Six, six, June was D-Day. And we were all working on D-Day. But to give you the an idea of why I felt so sincere and so uh, sure that I was doing right was the fact that after Dr. Schulman had come in Monday and felt and spent six weeks going over grievance after grievance. At the, at the end of his hearing and his report that came back, our union received 58 out of the 72 grievances in our papers. That's a pretty high so, percentage, isn't it? That's right. So it showed me that, uh, uh, that we were right. Well, I was very sorry that we had to pull something like that during the uh, D-Day, before D-Day. Uh, it just got to the place where our people would rather not work than, than take what we were taking from the company. May I ask uh, how long these grievances had been accumulating? How old were the oldest ones, for example? It started on November the 6th in 1940, or 1943, November the 6th, and accumulated from November to uh, June the 1st of uh, 72 grievances that uh, every one of the grievances we ever presented was marked no. And you really we were not able, grievance. during that period of uh, something like uh, nine months or so, you really were not able to, uh, to get any of your grievances uh, resolved? Not a single one. Mm -hmm. We never received a yes on any one of the grievances. Mm -hmm. Were the grievances, uh, did you feel uh, given reasonable consideration, or was it just a, an offhand rejection because the attitude was that that there was no uh, necessity or no compulsion to um, uh, grant any of the uh, rewards that the workers wanted in the grievances? The only, the only thing that I can say, Dan, is that from the beginning, uh, <coughs> I, I accused the company of taking the position that on account of we were at war, uh, that they could refuse to grant any, to even accept grievances because of the patriotism they expected from all the people. Mm -hmm. and they just thought they could get by with uh, murder, and we decided that we wasn't going to die. That's I it. see. Do you, uh, uh, it may be that it isn't necessary to probe this deeply into that, but do you remember the nature of one or two of the grievances that uh, occur to you as to represent uh, a legitimate grievance on the part of the worker uh, out of these uh, 72 grievances, I believe you mentioned, or, or something yes, that you really... Yes, Dan, for instance, one of them, uh, uh, I remember you were on the committee. You know how the 
Yes, that was later. I, I yeah, lost that's that's right. later. But I say you were on the committee and you knew how the procedure that was uh, uh, in the contract, the way we went over, uh, took care of grievances. We had the first, second, third steps. Right. And then the answer from the company within three to five days. And if you would present a grievance that you thought was perfectly legitimate, as a violation of the contract, you would expect the company to uh, answer according to the provisions of the contract. Right. Which they would, would, didn't even consider because they didn't think that we would, could do anything on account of a war going on. And the, the company was just taking a position that uh, we'd work whether we liked it or not. And uh, so the one particular grievance, Dan, that I remember was the grievance we put in. We had a, a, a clause in our contract uh, on disability. You probably remember how we put that. Uh, where a man had a heart attack so became, uh, you know, uh, not able to do his regular job while we negotiated with the company a disability job. I remember. And we negotiated this Mr. Miller a job on sorting bolts, what they call sorting bolts for the assembly. Uh, the company decided that uh, they wanted to put some young lady in there to sort and bolt, sorting bolts and put Mr. Miller back on the line in the assembly. Now we had negotiated in good faith Mr. Miller's position and uh, disability position. The company just without consulting the union or anybody else just took the uh, privilege of putting him back on the assembly, not even consulting the committee or nobody. And uh, we took that as a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A, Direct violation. Direct probably. violation of any negotiations for that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, your understanding with him, Mr. Pickett. Yeah. And there's one thing I'd like to. Uh, one thing I'd like to read later. If I'm not sure. Tonight. I just like to read this. In this hearing. We were having a, this is on the grievances that we're talking about now. Right. Now, is this the arbitrator's ruling you're going to read, or is this the company's position, or what? This is, this is a position that I wanted to put, that we put to this, in this famous hearing we had. Uh, <clears throat> we would like to ask Mr. White a question if he is in a position to answer it. White, I will try. Who is White? He was the, the National Labor Relations Board representative. I see. From Morton. Mm -hmm. See, you have been with us in three or four cases which were referred to conciliation, in which the union has tried in every way to reach a harmonious settlement of grievances, and I know you tried to be of help. Both the union and the company know that. Can you state your opinion as to whether harmonious relations were being made with Mr. Gregory as representative of the man? If you can't answer that, all right. But all right. But what is your opinion? Now, this is Mr. White's answer. I don't believe it is proper, as a representative of the Department of Labor, not proper to enter into a discussion of the personalities involved. I can say very frankly, in the conferences I have had, there has not been good faith, labor, and there has not been any collective bargaining going on in any disputes I have been in on. Now, as to whether that is due to the individual you have said or not, I would not, of course, say. McConnell, to my knowledge, this present committee has accepted every recommendation handed down by the conciliator and company. I believe has a few, I, no, and the company, I believe, has refused to accept any one of conciliation's recommendations. Why? That is true of his conferences I sat in. I now that's our, that's our, uh, now is McConnell the chairman of your committee? He was the chairman of the negotiating committee. I was very deep. So you see, Ms. Dan, <clears throat> that convinces me that the company was not willing to bargain or go along with the contract during, during the war. They thought they could put us out of business. That was my opinion. I stick with it. Uh, I, I, I think, we have I think what you have just read is a pretty good uh, documentation of your point of view in particular regard. Uh, without passing judgment on the motives of anyone involved, it seemed to me that, that the arbitrator takes essentially uh, your point of view. 
Well, personally, Dan, I think I think he won the case and got Mr. Schumann to negotiate the grievances over that one statement with the wife. I see. Now, uh, moving along, uh, back or forth, either way you would want to go, uh, are there any other uh, what you would consider to be landmarks in the uh, growth and development of the local or in its uh, contribution to the community? Well, Dan and I, as you know, have been a controversial uh, individual in seven, but I'll say this. We've well, anyone been, who can win 17 elections out of 21 years, Jack, can't be too controversial among the majority of his colleagues, I think it's still work. But I'll say that it's been our, been our plan and our idea to take part in every worthwhile uh, you know, a bit, a proposition that's come up in the community that would, would benefit the people of this community. We've donated money, we've put in personal activities, our people have been active in the in the uh, community fund campaigns. We've never we've never refused to to help some worthy object like the heart cancer and so on. We've always been very we thought very liberal. So I think that we have contributed to quite some help to the community. Jack, have you uh, been a member of any other local uh, civic organization, for example, in the community yourself, uh, file a member of the local union too? Uh, well, I told you a little bit ago, Dan, I was pretty controversial. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I had one experience that I was very proud of. I was permitted to be a member of the Middletown Housing Authority, a member of that board. Outside of that, I've never been on any local community committee. I had two brothers in the local that we always give that job to because they were accepted. Now, one of them I know that you know very well was Brother Orville Rodifer. Yes, I do. He is now a city councilman. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then our present mayor, Brother Cooley. Right. Uh, Jack, uh, you've mentioned a couple of times now that uh, you were generally a controversial individual uh, within the community, probably uh, partly because of your labor union activity. Uh, if you're uh, willing to uh, develop that point a little further, uh, what do you consider to be the uh, major reasons for uh, your controversial status within the community? Uh, or if you don't want to respond to that, that's quite all right, too. But you seem to, uh, to think this uh, was... Uh, influential in uh, your contribution and also uh, your activities within the community. Well, Dan, I can say it very frankly. <clears throat> I have always believed in everybody having a right to their opinion, but that I didn't have to agree to their opinion. Mm -hmm. They had a right, I had a right to my opinion, and they didn't have to agree to my opinion. Uh -huh. But I've always had the, the thought in my mind that if I was president of this local union, or an officer in any manner, that my first duty was to give an honest representation to the people that elected me. And when you operate as president of Local 287, you operate for, if there's 3,000 members, you operate for 3,000 members. Not, I never had any idea that I wanted to be a dictator. So when I appeared before any management or any committee in which I was asked to do something that I thought was detrimental to the best interests of the people I represented, right then I became a different person. I became a representative of the people that I represented. And I would wouldn't let anything, if I could help it, stop me. For instance, Dan, I don't know whether you remember this or not. You should. It, there was two big headlines appeared in our local newspapers, at which time I was accused of being a big goon. That's where I say I was unpopular, whatever you want to call it. When was this, Jack? I cannot remember the exact dates, but the first, the Monday Morning Star had a headline, Wore the gear to board up all the windows. 
in the evening press it came out, grass is to grow down the middle of Walnut Street. A big one inch headline. And then a big story about how mean I was. Do you remember approximately when the story is? 41. Right. That's when I'm I'll look that up and uh, reread it for my own information. I want you to. I, I know you can get it up. up the flag yes, it's up. there. Do you remember approximately what time, 41, uh, spring, summer, fall? Or? And then I had been very interested in the council in knowing that Muncie wasn't going to have any war work. Mm -hmm. Now this, to me, was, uh, was another one of my worries. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that if we didn't get war work, they wasn't going to get any brass, they wasn't going to get any copper, they wasn't going to get any kind of material to build uh, conventional transmissions or, or anything in the city of Muncie because of the war. Right. Which meant that thousands of people were going to be laid off. <coughs> so I was sent to Washington to meet with the War Labor Board. And I was told that the people who hear the, um, the article I'm telling you about, Dan, about the grass and so on, was, was caused because I said the Chamber of Commerce, I accused the Chamber of Commerce of not wanting to get war work for Muncie because it would be a boom and bust. In other words, if we got the war work in there, stopped the conventional work, changed over machinery, tools, and everything that had to be done, and the war only lasted three months, it would be a bust and boom. And the Chamber of Commerce didn't want it. I accused them of <clears throat> trying to get Muncie, the Muncie community in Delaware County into a poverty area. Mm -hmm. And if you know what that'll do, when you start fighting the Chamber of Commerce, right. you know what it'll do. So I was called in, as I told you, by the company after we got the word that we wouldn't receive any more brass or copper and so on. We went to Washington and we got the war work. So that's controversial. Yes, it seems that's to be. That's what I meant. Right, right. Jack? Some of the other uh, achievements, it seems to me, that have been made, uh, one, for example, would be this building that we're uh, recording this interview in right now. I uh, remember, again, uh, when I was in my early 20s, uh, working at Warner Gear, uh, visiting, uh, attending a meeting of uh, Local 287 on South Walnut Street in the Benedum Building, and I remember, uh, too, uh, hearing you give a very passionate uh, and a very... Um, uh, eloquent speech, uh, pleading with the membership and with the leadership of the organization to uh, do something to establish a home for Local 287 and possibly for organized labor in the community. Now, as I drive along in front of this beautiful building and see a labor center on the front of it, and I come in and, and see what a wonderful uh, building that you have here, uh, I contrast this with a situation that prevailed, for example, back about 1950 or 51, and it seems to me that this uh, has to be considered as uh, a major achievement uh, of Local 287, of uh, the local labor movement. Uh, am I uh, looking too much at material uh, developments here, or is this really uh, a mark of achievement? Well, this is, all, of course, Dan, this is one of the, uh, to me, one of the uh, greatest achievements. You know, you can go in the plant, and you can uh, represent and benefit people in wages and and uh, the of working conditions and pensions and so on. That's collective bargaining. But when you can build a home where you can have your meetings in your own privacy, where you can have something that, that uh, enhances the beauty of the community, when you can have uh, a building that all the people of uh, labor can be proud of, uh, to me that was a crowning achievement of our local. As far as... Uh, uh, being, uh, you know, happy, uh, not happy, but it was a happy event. Uh, I was very much uh, pleased, of course, that I happened to be the president today, the year rather, that the building was uh, dedicated. To me, that's one of the milestones of my uh, <clears throat> history in Local 287. But I want to say this, I, uh, you can pat people on the back, Dan, you can say, well, Jack done this, and Jack done that, and Jack done something else. But you know, I'm always going to believe, and I'm always going to think my own mind, that without the help, the love, and the affection of all the people that paid their dollar a month dues at that time, 
uh, backing you up and helping you and encouraging you, I'd been just another union member. So I don't pat myself on the back, but I'm happy that I was in a position that I could be uh, probably some help in some leadership way that we have this beautiful building, and I'm proud of it. Very fine, Jack. Uh, let me ask you uh, now, uh, what's going on upstairs? I see tables set out uh, in a large uh, room, and uh, I see, uh, I think, uh, silverware on the tables and so on and so forth. Uh, what's going on up there today? Dan, that's another one of our uh, 287's contributions to <clears throat> other outside groups. We have what's known as the Delaware County Senior Citizen Association, uh, made up of uh, a great number of widowed women and, and senior citizens that never belong to unions. And they meet in our local room there once a month, once a, a week rather, every Wednesday. And they have their little program and they have their card games and then on the first meeting of the month, they have a carry-in dinner, and that's what's going up on up there now, and that's one of our contributions to, to the senior citizens of our community. We're very much interested right now, and we are working very hard to help them secure the funds to build a home of their own. Very fine. Now, Jack, is this the uh, group that you are uh, president of? No, no, that's not the group. I see. In You're the president case. of the local union retirees. Well, let's say it this way, Danny. In 19... Sixty-five, sixty-six. The national international convention meeting in Long Beach, California, set up what's known as the local union retiree chapters. I see. Uh, we have a dues of, of one dollar a month. We meet the first Monday in each month. Uh, we have one of our the president of our chapter is a member of the local union executive board with voice and vote. And we are only located, we're only located with the local union itself. We're a part of the local union. All right, I see. Uh, Jack, I don't want to keep you too much longer. You might miss that uh, fine lunch that I know is going to be served upstairs uh, very soon. I'd like to ask you a couple of uh, philosophic questions, if I may. Uh, it seems to me that uh, conditions are, are rather... Uh, considerably different now in the factory uh, than they were in 1937, 1939, for example. Uh, what tangible and intangible benefits, for that matter, does a factory worker gain from belonging to a labor union such as the UAW? And uh, a related question to that, what uh, kind of uh, argument or what kind of uh, persuasive point of view can be put forth uh, in the factory today to encourage young people uh, who've gone to work at Warner Gear, let's say, in the past, uh, since 1960, a uh, new generation. What inducement can be used to uh, get these people interested in the labor movement? Uh, what can they gain, in short, from becoming a member of Local 287? Well, then you know life is short at the most. <clears throat> the, if I understand your question the way I think I understand it, the right being oriented to what, why the union's here. Mm -hmm. The union's here for a purpose. We wouldn't have had a union if it hadn't have been necessary to get benefits that we couldn't get any other way. Mm -hmm. And when we had the Wagner Act presented to Congress and passed, that gave us the right to do what we've been doing. Now, of course, it's been several, uh, maybe a generation from the time that started until the present day. And unless the young fellow is told by his parents, or if his parents still belong to union, he takes everything that he sees out in the plant for granted. The two dollars and a half an hour, That's or, right. uh, the uh, seniority rights, That's and right. all the other advantages that uh, he inherits. In other words, in other words, Dan, he thinks that that's all given to him on a platter. Uh -huh. He doesn't know how many times old Jack Reed and two thousand other Warner Gear boys wore the bottoms of the shoes out to get a little seniority, right. to get 
and the ways and wages to get a pension, to get vacation pay, to get all these benefits. They don't know that. Any because they're just little boys. That's right. Now, if that's explained to them in a way, uh, in, in an educational way, I mean, you can't just get up and say, now look, this is what happened. You can't offend them. They, those young people of this day want to be, I think they, they're just as good as a, when I was a boy. Although I didn't have any protection when I was a boy, they've got it now. The union's given it to them. That's right. And they have to learn why and how, I think. And I think that the education, of the, the uh, what you call the, the program of education, is a program that's got to be given to. Now, uh, Jack, have you tried to get anything started along these lines? Well, Dan, <laughs> let's say it this way: I have been appointed, and I don't think I'm qualified to do it. But they insist that I'm going to do it. I've been appointed to be the chairman of the uh, education. That is, to try to get these young fellows to understand what, how they got the union and why they got the union. I think it's very important that somebody come in that's, uh, you know, had some training and all I can tell them is uh, how many times I had to dumb on my fist and how many times I've had to go home and not be able to sleep and other things. That's all I can tell them. I mean, I think there ought to be some sort of a, a you know, like we have in the school, some Somebody that really believes and knows what they got ought to be in here to tell them what the real score is. I, I can tell them what happened, and that's all. I'm not an educator. Jack, I, uh, uh, I think that I would uh, have to insert here, as uh, someone who spent a great deal of time uh, studying uh, American history, and including, of course, uh, the labor movement, that uh, the only thing you would need to present would be a truly objective history of the development of the American labor movement and uh, this could be done by any uh, professional historian who uh, has uh, the background training in the field. Now, I don't know what's available um, in your community, but uh, if uh, we had the large uh, labor uh, interest and uh, movement and membership in uh, Miami, for example, where I'm currently living, that you have in this community, uh, we'd be happy to send a man out to work with you and to develop a course if you want and uh, to offer it right here on your uh, premises if, if you wanted that at a nominal cost. Now, I don't know whether this is possible uh, in the community that you have because you don't really have a community college. You have a, a state university located here now. And I don't uh, know what their philosophy is, but uh, it might pay you to uh, talk to Dr. Farrell and uh, let him talk with the appropriate uh, people at the university. The chairman of my committee, incidentally, uh, Dr. Uh, Schmidt, uh, did his uh, doctoral work at Wisconsin uh, under some prominent uh, labor historians, and uh, his uh, dissertation, like mine, was on the labor movement. Of course, his was in Wisconsin. And uh, he is an extremely competent individual, and uh, of course, he is in the history department. And uh, as a bit of advice, which I didn't intend to include in this, but I think you might very well talk with uh, Dr. Carroll, who's uh, chairman of the history department, and he might talk with uh, Dr. Smith or some other people. And it might be possible to, uh, to get them uh, to uh, some way assist you in developing the kind of orientation program that you suggest. It might very well be a worthwhile project, not only for the uh, new people, but I suspect that a lot of retirees would be quite interested in uh, hearing something about uh, an orthodox historian's uh, point of view on um, the American labor movement. And I think you've come to see that what was going on here in Muncie in 1939 uh, was quite comparable to uh, a nationwide movement at the time. So I think you're on the right track, and I, I'd pursue it. I wouldn't give up that idea. Well, I wouldn't uh, know, and I, I know I would have done right. We're in, a, we're in a bad... Jack, we uh, read in the current... Uh, periodicals and newspapers uh, and even hear speeches by leading uh, labor officials uh, in uh, the current time in the past few years, that organized labor has pretty much uh, peaked. It's already gained the objectives for which it was organized in the 1930s, such uh, as the bread and butter issues of uh, guaranteed annual wage, uh, retirement benefits, uh, paid vacation, seniority rights, and uh, the high wage that you were talking about a while ago. And uh, that some people are beginning to wonder uh, whether uh, 
there is any cause for uh, justification for uh, continued labor union activity now. Uh, one response of the young men might be, well, uh, so what? You fellows uh, won this, uh, but uh, why should I continue to work for it? I already have it. Now, where is labor going from here? Do we need new objectives? Uh, what are the objectives that, that appeal to the new labor union member <coughs> in 1969? And I know can't answer a question like that without going back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. In 1969, of course, we're in a new generation. We're in a new decade, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But the, the object of needing the right kind of leadership and, and, have, and labor in existence today is just as important as it was in the 1936s. Uh -huh. Because I believe, and I see no reason why uh, I have anything to back, go back on to, to think otherwise, is that if we give the people who manage the industrial uh, complex of our country ever have a chance to put the working people back to where we were even close to where we were back in the 1936 you'd see the greatest revolution you ever saw in your life because people today will not take uh, what we took in 36 uh, near as long as we had to take it in those days. do you remember in 1936 and back beyond 1936 uh, a man who was in the prime of his life couldn't get a job after he came age 40 you remember that? Yes, of course, uh, I was a boy at the time, but I remember Certainly. reading about those conditions and hearing you people talk about them. Oh, that would happen now. That was part of my education. You yeah, think I it's impossible for that to happen, Dan? No, I don't think it would be impossible. But I think that it seems uh, extremely remote to uh, a young man who's grown up in, in the society of abundance that we talk about today, uh, whereas it was a pressing immediate concern of you, Jack, and of other people who were uh, directly experiencing back in the 1930s. Well, I think, Dan, the idea is to, is to protect what you got. Mm -hmm. Whether you, whether it's uh, significant to ask for more and keep asking for more and more and more, you still have to have the, the authority, you still have to have the right, legal right, to protect what you have, because that can be taken away from you. Right. Jack, uh, again, we're about to run out of tape, but another philosophical question. Uh, in your opinion, is it necessary for a labor union in order to protect what it has to continue to aspire to obtain more. In other words, is it impossible just to remain static and say, well, now we've, we've uh, reached it, so uh, uh, we're just going to hold on to what we've got? Or do you have to continue having new goals and new ideals uh, to hold up in front of the young people to keep them interested even in retaining what they have? Can sir, you stand still? Sir, I don't... Why should we stand still? The companies... Are, are building and working and developing ways and means of producing, uh, that building machinery to produce their product uh, much more economical. They're, they're, they're eliminating thousands of jobs. Uh, in other words, they're building their, their uh, product much cheaper. Now, why shouldn't the employee have the right to have their share of that product, price of that product. Well, I mean, they're entitled to that. They shouldn't stand still and say, look, company, you can go on now and do anything you want to. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, Jack, uh, it's been a, an extremely uh, interesting and personally rewarding uh, experience for me having a chance to sit here and talk with you for the last hour. And I do indeed uh, very deeply appreciate uh, your consideration and taking the time out to uh, come down and uh, spend this hour talking with me about uh, your uh, experiences uh, as a, an active leader in uh, the history of Local 287. And uh, if I may add a personal note, I can think of no one who has added a greater uh, contribution to the development of the local and the labor movement in the community in spite of the fact that you might have been controversial in the minds of some people. Uh, again, Jack, thank you very much, and I'm quite sure that uh, people are going to hear this tape in the future. And uh, remember uh, a great man who made great uh, contributions uh, to local history. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Dan.
Jack, uh, you are now giving me uh, some material that I think is going to be extremely uh, beneficial to me in my research, and I wasn't aware that you'd brought this along uh, to leave with me, but I think that a uh, record probably should be made of the fact that one of the items you've just handed to me is uh, the first contract between Local 287 and Warner Gear, and uh, I, I hadn't been able to uh, find anyone else who suggested that they might even know where one existed. So uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and what other material do you have that you think? Well, I, I have here our first group insurance plan that I think would be very interesting. Yes, it would. The way the doctor bills are today, I mean the hospital bills stay in with this one, you're putting your weed. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I got it. I, I see you have several newspaper clippings and uh, other oh, yes, things. I got some newspaper clippings, but I don't think they're. It's hard to say, Jack, what would or would not uh, be. Um, Helpful until we look through it and uh, see what kind of information we really have. But again, thank you uh, very much for this material as well as for the uh, conversation.